Hey guys, welcome to Basketball Network 101. I am your host, Stephen B, and I am more than happy to welcome the Washington Wizards power forward and one of the best sharpshooters in the NBA, Davis Bertans. Uh, let me just start with uh, your decision not to not to play in the bubble. You were actually the first uh, NBA player to decide to skip the whole Orlando experiment. What was the reasoning behind your decision? Well, I think there were multiple reasons. Of course, one of the things was then, uh, one of the main ones, I guess, uh, was that I was an upcoming free agent and uh, we were put in a position as like very unlikely to make the playoffs and to risk an injury after uh, not playing basketball and not really working out for for almost two months. And uh, and that was that was the main reason. But at the same time, it was uh, still so many unknowns going if I was going to Orlando and uh, and also the chance of not seeing my family for a month and a half or two, or even if we go some all the way, it's about three months. So, so all those all those things together uh, that you know made me decide to to not go. How satisfied are you with the way you've uh, utilized your time off? You know, in preparation for the next season. Well, since the situation with the COVID is uh, is not so bad in Latvia, like we've been able to practice. Uh, basically since I got back and uh, you know just it's usual regular off-season workouts uh, the only difference is that I don't know when the season's going to start uh -huh. and uh, you know just I I'm not really a guy that's working on one particular thing in the off-season I'm just trying to be in shape for when the season comes keep working on my shot and, and, and be sure that I'm ready and uh, that's that's basically it yeah, it's it's a tough time to be an NBA player. You know, there's so many uncertainties about, you know, each and every game, basically. So, yeah, I understand your decision. I was, uh, I was actually, I understood it. You know, from the first day, there was that uh, beef uh, with uh, Evan Fournier on Twitter. Can't what really was, call yeah. that a beef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, he tried to take shots on uh, on you. So, what was your reaction to? Uh, well, Tweet. I was just uh, thinking to myself, you know, I didn't really say it out loud, but uh, if I had a, another year of guaranteed uh, 19 million a year, then, you know, I would have probably also be there in a, in Orlando and playing and, and also a team having a playoff opportunity. It's a completely different thing. It's like, like you got to try to imagine somebody like being in somebody else's shoes in that situation. And, uh, you know, if, if we really, like, for example, Phoenix proved that they were, they were in the bubble, but really didn't have a shot to make the playoffs. So they went eight and zero, and they didn't make the playoffs. That means that there was no chance for them to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless if they get super lucky, if somebody loses the games they're not supposed to lose, and uh, and for us, for the Wizards also, you know, you saw that uh, you know there's the games that uh, our team had to play were uh, mostly against top teams in the league this season, so. Winning at least winning even one game was was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. No, having been through two ACL injuries, you've uh, missed a uh, significant time on two different occasions. How hard is it to make a transition? You know, going from recovery to getting back to basketball shape to playing competitive basketball basketball again. Well, that's basically you can compare that to learning how to walk. Yeah. You, you, you kind of slowly start getting used to all the movements again and it's a, it's a step by step every day all throughout the nine ten months of the of the rehab and once yeah. you get to like six months you're technically at 100 percent but you know no one's putting you on a court yet because you need those three months to kind of build up the basketball shape again is it uh, challenging psychologically uh, in some way yes and no i think it depends more on the person you know, I was the type of guy that I basically, the first one was uh, challenging just because, uh, you know, I had a breakout year in EuroLeague, uh, still 19 years old, and, and having an injury like that at that age was, it was tough. Like, at first, it's like, in my head, it's like, well, that's that's it. I'm not, I'm never going to get back to what I was. <laughs> and then it just takes some time, you know, kind of getting used to the idea that I have to go through the surgery and, uh, and then the whole rehab process. Like I didn't know what, I, what to expect, but once I got to that, it was a, it was just a day by day progress. You're feeling better every day. You're getting better, you get better every day. So, so in that way, mentally, it's not tough. Like you have a simple, it's a simple job. You just do 
do do what somebody tells you to do every single day. You do it to the best of your ability, and uh, it's gonna get better. And with the second one, it was that was easy actually. <laughs> you know, I know that uh, might might be really tough with the with the injury like that, but uh, but once once I realized that I did it once, I could do it again. Yeah. My, my daughter came to visit. <laughs> Say hello to your daughter. <laughs> well done. Uh, having said that, uh, how how impressive has the level of basketball shown in the bubble been? You know, because guys uh, guys have been they haven't been through what you've been through with the injuries, but they did take the two three months long break before they started playing again. You know, how how surprised are you with the level of basketball shown in Orlando? Well, in the beginning, there was no surprise. I think uh, with the first games that they played, the uh, the friendly games and then, then the reseeding games, uh, you could see the guys haven't played basketball for a long time like some turnovers were just ridiculous like kids were doing at age like 10 12 uh but you know as soon as you could see that more games more practice uh, everybody got to feel better again on the on the court you could see that they were doing much much better and uh you know now now i think most of the teams are at the at their top level what they should be at the playoffs yeah are you still are you watching basketball on daily basis nba well, as it's in the middle of the night for me, then, uh, you know, I, I got the little one right here. Uh, that takes the mo most time of the day, as you can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the re rest of the time, once once she goes to bed, you know, it's... Uh, I, I always go to bed earlier, like 10, 10 p.m., so don't really have much time to watch those games. I, I did watch some Wizard games, but, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's just something us Europeans have to. That's a challenge for us Europeans, you know. But NBA basketball fans, yeah. it's tough, man. <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, what's your take on the Washington Wizards' uh, bubble performance? You know, you were you were only able to beat the Boston Celtics in your final regular season game. You now, how would you rate your run in the bubble? I think it was a great, great experience for the for all, all the young players, you know, and considering that. Uh, Bradley Beal wasn't there. I wasn't there. We were the top two scorers on the team. Uh, together, we, we were scoring like 45 points a game. So so that was a big, big void to fill. And, uh, you know, some guys took the challenge and and Thomas Bryant played great. And, uh, Troy Brown did, uh, did great. So, yeah, as I said, uh, some guys did really use their chance and, uh, and improved. And I think they used it really great as a, as a great experience and practice just, you know, to grow for the next season. There's certainly some things to look forward with the Wizards organization. You know, there's some great young talent, you included. So, yeah. It'll be it'll <laughs> be a bright young, future. I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's only your fourth year in the NBA, right? Yeah, I finished my fourth. So yeah, th things are looking good. I mean, uh, your regular season performance might not uh, show that, but I do really think that you have the bright future, you know, ahead of you. Uh, you you had a great run with the Wizards. You had a breakout year. You have cemented yourself as uh, one of the elite NBA shooters. You know, what's the story behind your emergence? Uh, I think it was just uh, being traded from uh, from San Antonio was was a blessing. It's, guys, it's, it's not a great feeling to be traded. It feels like somebody's given up on you, but at the same time, uh, Wizards jumped in and uh, they really wanted to see me on their team. The GM, Tommy, said he had been following me since since I was 18 playing in the European Championship. And, uh, you know, just kind of fell into a right position and in the right place at the right time. You know, they, they let me do whatever I do best. And gave me the green light. I never heard any complaints uh, from the teammates or, or the coaches that I'm taking a bad shot, even though I know that very many of them are bad, even though they, they went in. But but yeah. and, uh, I think that just having that freedom that that I used to have when I was playing in Europe, uh, that kind of opened up uh, a lot of opportunities for me. Do you think that uh, San Antonio didn't utilize you the right way when you were there? Uh, well, that's well. That's a different team, a different uh, system, and uh, 
you know, in some way I was in, a, in, a, in my last year in San Antonio, I, I had a pretty good season overall, you know, especially from the three-point line uh, with DeMar DeRozan creating yeah. and uh, playmaking and kicking out the ball. It was, it was, it was a good year for me too. And, uh, but in some way, of course, it was a, it was a different system. So I was more of a spot up shooter and, uh, and the team was built different. So I can't really say that they didn't utilize me the way I should be used. But, uh, as you know, every, every coach has their own uh, idea of how they want to play, how they want their players to play. So, you know, I'm a guy that I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, adjusted and, and play the, the right way the team wants me to play. And yeah. since Wizards gave me the chance to play this way, I did this season, uh, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity because that was the way I was, I was used to play. Yeah. Uh, this year you, uh, you cemented yourself as one of the best shooters in the NBA. You were always a great shooter, but uh, the volume of shots you're taking for the Wizards is just through the roof compared to your three, uh, first three seasons with uh, Spurs. Was there ever a moment where you were like, okay, let me just specialize in shooting? You know, let me just become a specialist, become a shooter and work my way through the league. You know, did... I, I couldn't really say that I was really, really trying to be a, a specialist, a three-point shooter. You know, of course, I would want to be an all-star or, or a superstar or one of the best in the world. But, uh, yeah. you know, we, we have to understand our roles and uh, our strengths and... Uh, you know, it took took me some time to understand that uh, you know that that's that's the best thing I'm doing, and and the best way to keep myself on the team and and get minutes is if I keep using my strengths and try try to hide my weaknesses. So yeah. you know, we all know that I'm not a guy that's really gonna create off the dribble and, and go to the rim and finish and and do all those things. And you know, I've always been a shooter and uh, well, basically since I was a kid. And you know, with with the height, that helped. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So defenders can't really guard me, and uh, you know, I, I didn't really think it like it was a special thing that I was going for, but it just turned out that way. And uh, you know, it, it, it's great to play in the, in the 21st century when the shooters are really needed. Yeah, it really works in your favor. You know, you're really the the prototype power forward for today's NBA. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned you were always a great shooter. Uh, what what is what, what is your secret? You know behind your shooting ability. Well, probably the biggest one is that I was born in a basketball gym. Really? My, my, yeah. Well, born in the basketball gym. In my, in the not that, literally. Uh, yeah, yeah. So in the sense that uh, my my dad was a coach. He was also a gym teacher. My mom was a gym teacher. So. Me and my brother were we were on the basketball court since day one, so so I guess that that that's a secret. <laughs> Do you have a go-to routine that keeps you in the shooting rhythm, like everyday routine you go through? I don't really have a special routine. I know that there's a some shootings like some shooting exercise that I got to do from time to time. You know, if, if I'm in a great shooting shape, I could go without two weeks uh, without two weeks practicing shooting. Yeah, I'll just go to the games and uh, and keep knocking those shots down. But uh, you know, once once the percentage start dropping, uh, there are some things that is like I, I know that I have to do some higher intensity shooting that I have to run a lot and and feel like I'm I'm tired when I'm shooting and that's like the best time when I'm uh, I'm actually getting better at my sh at my shot. So basically, simulating the game situation in terms yeah. of fatigue and stuff. Yeah. Do you think that uh, once uh, shooting ability is naturally limited, do you think you can outwork your shooting God-given talent? If you know, if you know what I mean. Oh, uh, I think in some way yes, but uh, I think there's there's a a lot of players that are proof that you know you can't really become a great shooter if you don't have some kind of a feel for the shot, like since birth basically. Because yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you know that all, all the guys are trying to improve their three-point shooting. Everybody wants to be a better shooter, uh, especially now. And, you know, there's there's not a, good, a lot of guys in the league that's going to be like Steph, Damian Lillard, and, and come off screens and off dribble, shoot half-court shots, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I think, you know, I've heard rumors. I don't know. I haven't seen it personally that Steph Curry doesn't really work on his shooting. It's just natural 
feel yeah. and touch and ability that is just been there the whole time. So, so I don't really think it's like I think players can improve their shooting by just open spot up shots that they can get better at that. But there's not a lot of guys that can uh, come off screens, uh, shoot contested shots, and still have that feel to just off balance make those. We'll take for for instance. Uh thing as simple as free throws. You see a lot of guys struggling from the free throw line. And then you have guys like Andre Drummond completely changing their free throw, his free throw routine. And, you know, he isn't a world beater from the free throw line, but he's become respectable from there. That's, yeah. you know, that's, that's something yeah, that... Yeah, that's exactly, that's the, the, the free throws, uh, spot up shots, the, like those, those are the shots that you can really just improve by working on it every day. The more you shoot, the better you can get. But, uh, you know, the, the other mm -hmm. ones, And I think that's just the natural ability. As somebody can jump really high, then uh, then yeah. some guys can shoot better. How important is the psychological aspect of shooting? You know, it's because I think it's at the end of the day, it's all mind games. You know, you have you get into the rhythm, then you get into the slump. You have to get yourself out of it. You know how 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 difficult it is to keep your mind sharp when you're shooting the ball. Well, I think that the only way you can get out of uh, a slump is by just if you keep shooting. Like that's the first uh, the first rule. If you're a shooter, you keep shooting, with, whether you're making or missing. Uh, if you have your shot, you take it. And that's the only way. Sometimes you, you just need one to fall and yeah. everything goes back to normal. So, of course, it's a, it's a, lot, it's a lot on your mind sometimes because that, that part is really important because, you know, if you miss shots and you start thinking about the next one, if you're going to take it or not, like then you're beat, you're down, and it's almost impossible to get out of that. So... But once the shot is falling, you know, then yeah. and you know that you can sometimes even close your eyes and just let it fly and it goes in. Yeah, yeah. I bet that's a great feeling, you know. It's, it's pretty amazing, yeah. Uh, you, you were talking about the freedom to shoot, you know. You, you played in Europe and you also played in, you were also playing in the NBA. Uh, how, dif how different is the coach's approach in terms of, you know, when you're uh, missing your shots, uh, do Europeans coach tend to like limit your uh, number of shots when you're not in the zone compared to NBA NBA coaches? Uh, I think in Europe overall is like the offense is more balanced and the coach keeps calling plays and players just kind of run off of that. If in, in Europe, if you're a shooter, then there may be one or two plays for you. And uh, if the play is not called, you're probably not going to get the shot. So yeah. and that mostly happens maybe once or twice a quarter in Europe so you know you're not gonna really get much more than eight attempts a game if you play all 40 minutes yeah uh, in terms of if you look at, in the NBA then you know very often when I just checked in the game then the first three offenses and like I was just coming down running and somebody setting a screen and shooting immediately so so there's a big difference and uh, in some way I think here when somebody gets hot like in the NBA then the team is trying to milk it as much as possible. Like for, even if it's like a stretch for two, three minutes, you just try to get the most out of that, that streak. And then, uh, you know, then if, if the guy misses a shot or two, then you, you start to go to somebody else again. Uh, your shooting ability brought you to the 2020 NBA All-Star Weekend. You participated in the NBA uh, three-point shootout. You finished third, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, who won? Was it Joe Harris? Uh, no, Buddy Heald. But uh, what was that experience like, you know, kid from Europe coming to the U.S. and participating in the NBA All-Star Weekend? It was a lot of fun. It was it was a great experience. You know, I had my family was there with me. So in some way, I think I enjoyed more the part that I had the, the shooting practices and, and my daughter was running around the court. Uh, and at the same time, of course, the experience at the, at the All-Star Game was, at the weekend was... Uh, You know, walking out at three-point contest and when, when you're alone, it's a completely different feeling than it is when you're you're going out there with your four teammates at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And having about twenty thousand or more people just watching you shoot, like I'm gonna say that uh, that was probably the first time in my life that I felt a little bit nervous before shooting. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What was the most you put up in a round? Was it twenty six? Uh, the first one was twenty six. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive, man. Do Are you going to participate again? Well, if I get the invitation, of course. Yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like the first one was a good practice and the second one, I got to win it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're rooting for you, man.
You're, what's next for Davis Bertans? You're going to be a free agent uh, this summer. Uh, I don't know if you're thinking about your next destination. How realistic is for you to stay with the Wizards? Well, that's, I think, more up to them than me. You know, during the season, we've, we've both expressed, both sides have expressed that, you know, I enjoyed it in, in, in D.C. I love the team, coaches, teammates. Uh, everything was great. And, and they love me and they want me to stay. So, so I think uh, it's going to be a job for the agent and the GM to yeah. come to, a, to an agreement in that sense. And, uh, you know, that's that's their job and uh i can't really interfere with that you know i'm gonna let my agent do his thing and uh like my job is just to make sure that if i if i'm playing in dc i play for that team 100 percent that i'm ready and uh yeah yeah that's great man uh let me just uh ask some quick quick fire questions so who's the best teammate you've ever played with uh mano ginobili Really? Not Kawhi Leonard? <laughs> Manu Ginobili, 100%. Yeah. What, what separates him from the others? I think just overall that, you know, he's a, he's, he's a player that doesn't think about himself. He's willing to sacrifice his body even when he was 40 years old. Like, if you see LeBron coming full speed down, he's going to try to take a charge, which is still ridiculous to me. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and just being overall a great teammate is, uh, it's not just about being a great player. Like, off the court, he's going to be helpful. He's going to talk to you like he's gonna make sure that everything's good that you're ready and uh and he re he was really taking care of the team yeah yeah uh who's the toughest player to guard in the nba for you uh for me i think in in, in my position the toughest one is uh kevin durant that's for sure and uh but you know if i get switched on to some smaller guards then uh i guess steph curry might be the toughest one <laughs> he's non-stop man <laughs> Because, yeah, you know, you can't really do much either. You don't let him shoot threes and he goes score the layup or yeah, yeah. You, you hope that he misses the three. Uh, who's the best player in the league? The best player in the league right now? Well, since we got so many guys with injuries, then, you know, I got to go with LeBron. Like the stats he's been putting up the whole season at, at his age and, you know, being the, the team with the best record in the West which is a tough conference. Uh, um, like this season, I'm I'm almost hell LeBron. Uh, who's the GOAT, in your opinion? Oh, Michael Jordan, that's 100%. <laughs> you were quick on that. <laughs> Did you watch The Last Dance? Uh, of course. And what was your take on The Last Dance documentary? Well, the, the times have changed a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're not going to see somebody smoking a cigar in a locker room. That's what, uh -huh. that's what I'll tell you. But, <laughs> but, you know, overall, the, the, the biggest take was, uh, you know, he's he, I think he's the greatest player of all time because the way he was beat up every single game he played and, uh, and still being able to win and put those numbers up is, is incredible because, you know, you can't touch nobody right now in the NBA and uh, just so... So players don't get hurt, but like yeah. back then, it looked like uh, every single day could have been the last one for Michael Jordan. Yeah, it was war, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is your all-time starting five? All-time starting five. Like I know that I had to put it together already once. Uh, <laughs> at point guard, I think I said uh, Steve Nash. Wow. Uh, shooting guard, I went with Michael Jordan. Then. Uh, that small forward, I think. What did I do? I think it was. I can't remember who that put. I think it was KD. Yeah. Uh, power forward, Tim Duncan. And uh, Shaq as a center. Oh, that's... <laughs> that's tough, man. <laughs> Is there a story behind your jersey number, 42? Uh, well. Uh, firstly, like my favorite number has always been number eight. My dad used to play with number eight, and uh, since I was a kid, I was always very number eight. But uh, since I moved away from Latvia, when I was in Ljubljana, number eight was taken, so I went with 24. Uh, so it was just simple math. 24 because of Kobe? Well, not so much in that way. I guess it was like a 50-50 it was a more. It was a two by four is eight. And, 
<laughs> and, and also being Kobe's number. But uh, so then after that, when I moved to Belgrade, I wanted to change it up a little bit. So I went with 44. Yeah. And, you know, once once I got to the to San Antonio, I think 44 was retired. Uh, then I didn't really want to go back to 24. So like I want something new. And, and I was also drafted 42nd. So that, yeah. that was... That was the number that made sense going to the NBA. Uh, what's your favorite game you played in the NBA? I think the one game in San Antonio, it was uh, last season when we played against Lakers at home. I think it was like mid-December or something. And, and we were struggling the whole, the whole first part of the season. And we had the comeback win in that game. And you know, at the end of the game, I think I made like three threes or four threes in the last quarter and one of them was like a big N one three at the end, yeah. uh, to just go four up, I think. So that was and that was a game that kind of propelled us into like eight or nine game win streak. So that was that was one of the favorites. That's great, man. Uh, you played for Greg Popovich. Can you think of a single anecdote, typical Greg Popovich anecdote? Man, what I've heard, like I didn't experience it myself, but a teammate said, and uh, you know, as he loves wine, uh, there was a couple of years before me, I guess, uh, in the playoffs in the first round, they're playing Memphis, and uh, and they had a game. So the night before the game, they had a team dinner. Yeah, and you know, no guy was drinking wine. Everybody was like regular, getting ready for the game. No alcohol, just eat the dinner and go home and get some sleep. And you know he was he was always uh you know telling guys that you know you got to enjoy some wine. <laughs> so he walks up to them and is like you got to drink some wine. I was like well coach is like we have a game we got the playoffs. I was like, I was like ooh playoffs like no just not playoffs like a bunch of pussies was almost <laughs> like. <laughs> Did he drink his wine that night? Oh he pop of course like he he <laughs> loves his wine that's that's like a. Like a lifeline for him, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you also played for Dusko Vyoshevich in Par Partizan. Can you tell us a single Dusko Vyoshevich anecdote? Well, not a lot of people know that uh, he had the uh, keys of most young guys' apartments that he can just swing by any time. Really? Like most, not, not all of the young guys, but I think the, the guys that he thought was, uh, you know, talented and uh, could make it in, the, in either EuroLeague or NBA. And... You know, some of those names are, it was, it was me, Milutinov, Bogdanovich, you know, he had, he had our keys and uh, just to check up on us. So we don't really go out anywhere. Like if he wanted to go out uh, to some clubs or somewhere uh, at night, if it was after midnight, we had to ask him for permission. And then we had to be home by 3 a.m. Call <laughs> that we we're home. And wow. <laughs> So it was That's it was crazy, basically man. it was that plus uh, uh, even if one of us would want to have a g girl over, then we would have to ask permission. Wow! The rules in place that none of that the night before the game. That's that's a no. So that's next level, man. <laughs> that is next level, but you know at the same time at that age, uh, it was good to have uh, somebody controlling us. I guess you know because it, it's it's easy to go off the tracks and. Uh, you know, you can see that uh, he really cared about the players. You know, it might have been a little crazy in some way. You know, some people maybe couldn't take it, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know, we were willing to live with that just to just to make it in, in basketball. How do you compare uh, Vujovic to Greg Popovich from just from the standpoint of uh, his coaching style? You know, the coaching style is, uh, is in some ways similar. Like they have. Uh, their own idea how they want to play and they're going to stick to that and uh, have everybody in their place and have those roles. Uh, and I think it's, uh, they're, they're in some way really similar. Of course, uh, we didn't really have a uh, 6 a.m. practices with uh, Pop, you uh -huh. know, with, with Coach Dula sometimes after some bad games and bad losses that we had to go to the, to the gym at 6 a.m. and basically have conditioning workouts. <laughs> in the morning so uh i think it was more of uh just the difficulty of the practices uh that was the biggest difference because you know in nba you, you rarely practice and uh, and i think san antonio was on the one of the teams that uh practiced the least during the season was pop, pop as loud as the doula 
<laughs> during definitely, timeouts and stuff. Definitely not. <laughs> Is you know, anyone? He, he would get mad. Like you could see then uh, the little bit of Yugoslavian blood in him that uh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. gets mad. But you can't compare nothing to Dula. <laughs> Uh, what surprised you the most uh, about life in the U.S. outside of the game of the basketball? Uh, it's hard to say that something surprised me. You know, I basically knew knew a lot. You know, you you see <laughs> when you're in Europe and uh, and you see a lot of stuff in the movies and uh, you know what's going on there, uh, either news or something like like the only thing I guess that surprised me was not not really the life. It was more the the basketball part that, you know, you go to the gym and you have a big practice facility, uh, but everything you can imagine in there just to make sure you're ready for the games compared mm-hmm. to in Europe that, you know, you, you're lucky if you have uh, three physios on a team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing you'd like Americans to know about Latvia, their home country. Uh, I, I don't think I can name one. So Name there's, a there's a few. I would say we got the best beer in the world. Really? Um, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion, yeah, but you know, yeah. not, not <laughs> objective. Uh, but uh, what else? What else? What else? You know, we got beautiful nature. Yeah, like seventy percent of the country is forest, so it's it's every everything's green. Like, even downtown is green. What about women? Women, uh, I would say also one of the most beautiful women in the world. Yeah. And uh, the last question, uh, did you ever play one-on-one with Kristaps Porzingis? And if you did, who won? Uh, I don't think we really played one-on-one. You know, yeah. if we had uh, with the national team in practice, if we had some uh, like one-on-ones that were, you know, you change the opponent sometimes, but I can't really recall. I don't think we really played one-on-one like that. Hypothetically, who would win? Well, I'm a competitor, so I'll say me. Yeah. <laughs> That goes without saying. <laughs> yep. Okay, Davis, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. No problem. Uh, we wish you best of luck wherever you end up going, whether you stay with the Wizards or you cha- you switch teams. And, you know, hopefully hopefully, we'll see a lot more from you in the upcoming Appreciate years. Thank you, thank man. You. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.